Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that we do know what happened, but I know for a fact this case will leave you all feeling very conflicted. Unlike most cases, the victim in this case will leave you feeling almost just as disgusted, if not more so, than the perpetrator. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody's thoughts are on this case. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Capital One Shopping. Capital One Shopping is a simple and free way to help you save money when you're shopping online. All you have to do is add Capital One Shopping to your browser, which is free and only takes seconds. Then Capital One Shopping will search for a better price as you shop online across thousands of stores like Target, Amazon, Walmart, and so many more. Then any coupons that it finds will instantly be applied to your cart at checkout. There are other browsers that everybody has heard of, but by installing Capital One Shopping, you're giving yourself the best chance at saving money. Last year, Capital One Shopping users saved over $160 million, and I for one know that I love free money. So, with Capital One Shopping, I was able to save $48 on a pair of boots that I was shopping for on Clark's. Then, I was also able to save $15 on a new air fryer convection oven, thanks to the deals that Capital One Shopping found for me. Capital One Shopping is available for Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Microsoft Edge, and Safari. So, if you want instant savings and free money, make sure you head to CapitalOneShopping.com slash rshannon or click the link in my description box below and add Capital One Shopping to your favorite browser. That's CapitalOneShopping.com slash rshannon for instant savings on thousands of purchases now. Thank you again so much to Capital One Shopping for partnering with me on today's video. And with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Thomas Merriman, who went by Tom, was 64 years old when he died. He was said to have grown up in the Midwest with a Catholic family with five brothers and one sister. He had previously been married, and in this marriage, he had two daughters and one son. Then he went on to get remarried to a woman named Jeanette in 1995, who had a daughter of her own named Jade, who was 14 years old at the time that the two got married. Then the couple went on to have a son of their own, who they named Cash. Tom was described by his brothers, who said, quote, Tom was a great father, son, brother, and friend. We want him to be remembered for his compassionate, kind, generous, caring, and selfless nature. He had this genius talent to grow and nurture living things. Tom had worked as a landscaper and a cabinet maker throughout his life, eventually living in Colorado and then San Diego, California. Tom was known to love working with his hands and enjoyed working on old cars in his spare time. Back in the early 2000s, he owned a wholesale palm nursery in Valley Center, California. By 2011, though, Tom met a man named Pat Flanagan. The two had both leased nursery space on the same property in Vista, and ultimately, they decided to just combine their businesses. The two started off by selling palm trees, but this just wasn't really feeling like a good fit for them. So, Pat went on to say that there was one night where the two were having a campfire with some beers, and they came up with the idea of starting a butterfly vivarium and selling pollinator plants that attract butterflies. So first, obviously, the two had to start learning about butterflies before starting any business with them. So, they recruited the founder of the Monarch Program, which tracked the migration of monarch butterflies, and the two of them, Pat and Tom, ran a vivarium until around mid-2013. Using that experience, they then decided to open up a butterfly farm by spring of 2013, and eventually, they ended up in Encinitas, California with Butterfly Farms. Tom was the day-to-day -day operations manager of Butterfly Farms, but Pat says that Tom was also the heart and soul of the operation. He was really good at helping people. 
Pat said that no matter how long the customer would stick around asking questions and looking around, Tom always listened to them to make sure that they had everything that they needed to start their own butterfly farms. Their farm includes a walkthrough vivarium with live butterflies and a boutique nursery that sells several pesticide-free varieties of butterfly-attracting plants, including native tropical species of milkweed for monarchs. The butterfly season is from April through November, and during that time, they would see hundreds of visitors every day, with many of them being students from San Diego County schools. They also held an exhibit at the San Diego County Fair each year, and that would attract over 50,000 visitors as well. Even though the school visits really dropped off in 2020 because of the pandemic, Pat reports that 2020 was actually a great year for them. The interest in home gardening really increased during this time because, as we know, everybody was stuck at home. So, their sales of butterfly-attracting plants just exploded. They went on to expand their milkweed production and built a second vivarium project at the farm in Poway. This whole year was really great for the business duo. Pat said that as the year was coming to a close, they were really excited to see where the future would take them. They toughed out seven-day work weeks basically every week for the entire year, so Tom was really looking forward to some much-earned time off. Butterfly season again was done in November, so Tom decided to take some time off in December. This was so he could undergo a laser eye surgery that he had planned on doing for quite some time, which he did complete on December 21st of 2020. But the aftermath of the surgery definitely did not go very well for him. He had fallen multiple times, and he actually ended up with two cracked ribs, two concussions, and facial injuries. All of these things prolonged the amount of time that Tom would spend away from work, and obviously, Pat was left with a lot of the operations by himself, which he didn't mind, but, you know, he was looking forward to seeing his work friend again soon, but unfortunately, he did not see him again after this. Now, Pat said that all throughout the time that he knew Tom, he was always a very private person, and he didn't talk much about his family, though he knew that Tom loved his children. Now, at the time, Tom had been living alone, but he was pretty much neighbors with his stepdaughter, Jade. Like I said, Jade met Tom when she was 14 years old, and soon after, her mom, Jeanette, and Tom became married. Now, for the first four years of the relationship, Jade actually lived with her biological father. However, Jade reported that Jeanette actually had some problems with drugs and alcohol, as well as a lot of other mental health issues. It was also stated that between the years of 2002 to 2008, there were multiple instances of domestic abuse within the marriage, but we don't really know any details beyond that. We don't know who was the perpetrator of domestic abuse and who was the victim. If you guys know, please do let me know but I wasn't really able to find any other details beyond that. But either way, when Jade was 18 years old, she moved in with her mother and her stepfather, Tom, to help them take care of her little brother, Cash. But according to sources, Jeanette's behavior just got so out of control at one point that her, Tom, and Cash all decided to pack up their stuff and leave the home in the middle of the night and by 2008, the couple was officially divorced. The three of them moved in together, so Tom, Jade, and Cash, and from there, Jade said that her and Tom developed a special bond. She helped Tom raise Cash, and she considered Tom to be a part of her family, and Tom even referred to Jade as his own daughter. So even though the two weren't biologically related, they always had a very close relationship so that even though her biological mother and him were divorced, the two kept in very close contact. But by the time Jade was 23, she decided to move out on her own. Now, Jade still kept contact with Tom over this time, but obviously they weren't as close as they had been before. Now, Tom had been living on Nardo Street in Solana Beach, California. By April of 2020, though, Jade also moved on to that same street 
and from there, the two were pretty much neighbors. Now, I don't think this was planned. I think she just happened to find a house on this street and moved there, but either way, the two were neighbors, so they were able to see each other a lot more often. So, now let's take a moment to talk more about Jade. Jade had previously graduated from San Diego Mesa College before attending Miracosta College. She started off working as a project engineer at Gordon Prill, a company that offers complete design and building services in one place. Then she worked at SunTile for outside sales. By 2013, she went on to work as a senior art sales consultant working at Natvia Investors. However, after that, by 2018, Jade established her own interior design venture. She went on to open Jade Jinx Interiors, which is a boutique interior design and decor studio. According to her LinkedIn bio, her business offers a unique custom tailored experience to remodel, refurnish, or restyle projects and focuses on creating functional and fabulous spaces or homes. She goes on to describe herself and her interest in interior decorating on her website, writing, quote, Jade has come from a family of builders slash remodelers and artists, and from a young age, she has been obsessed with everything home. She started working with her father on remodel projects in her teens and discovered a natural creative talent for designing and decorating interior spaces. Over the last 15 years, Jade has studied and applied the art of space planning and interior design, as well as the world of furniture layouts, applications, and decor. Jade absolutely loves helping making homes beautiful and understands how scary it can be trying to design a space on your own. You can count on Jade to hold your hand and make your project a fun one. During this time in April of 2020, Jade was off doing her own thing, living her best life and being successful in all that she was doing. However, she did notice that while Tom was living alone, he seemed really lonely and he seemed really sad like pretty much all of the time. So she started coming over to his house for weekly dinners and started helping him out around the house in any way that she could. Could. By December of 2020, Jade had gone on a trip to Cabo St. Lucas in Mexico. Around the same time, as we know, Tom had just underwent his laser eye surgery and he was struggling. He also had previous troubles with alcohol and drug abuse, which was getting really bad after surgery. That month, Tom had texted Jade to let her know that he had fallen and broken his ribs. He also sent her a text with a picture that showed a photo of a bloody tissue, bloody towels, and a whiskey bottle. After seeing this, she did offer to come home from her vacation, but he said that he didn't need her to. By December 15th, Tom had another fall. During this time, he alerted Jade again, and this time she called an ambulance to take him to the hospital. He stayed there for a few days for treatment for his broken bones, as well as for alcohol and Xanax problems. It seemed that during this time, he just was not doing well at all. By December 23rd, 37-year-old Jade went over to Tom's house once again to clean up before Tom returned home from the hospital. As she was cleaning, according to her, she bumped on Tom's computer mouse, which moved the screen so that his screensaver came up. And on the screensaver, she saw a pair of women's breasts. And after looking closer, Jade said that she realized that this picture was of her breasts. She had a beauty mark on her breast that she saw in the picture, so that is how she knew that this picture was of her. Again, as you could probably have gathered, the rest of the body was cropped out so that the picture literally only showed the pair of breasts, but according to her, it was obvious that this picture was of her. In this moment, she said that she was just completely shocked and in utter disbelief. After this, of course, she started looking more into the computer. She said that on the computer, there had been hundreds of more naked photos of her. Then she found different folders. Some of the folder names included JD Shower and JD Snatch. When she clicked on these folders, once again, a lot of the images were cropped, but she did find close-up images of her vagina, 
then there were also images that did clearly show her face while she was posing nude. After looking through the hundreds of photos, she realized that these photos came from a span of multiple years of her life. The earliest of these nude photos were taken of her when she was 16 or 17, and then she found photos from when she was 25 or 26. According to Jade, a lot of these photos were ones that she had sent to a past boyfriend. She did not send these photos to her stepdad, and she had no idea why he would have such pictures of her on his computer, and especially why it would be his screensaver. After seeing these photos, she actually remembered that there was a time where she had a digital camera with an SD card that she used to take some of these photos. Then she uploaded the photos that she had taken of herself to her computer. While living together, she thinks that Tom had access to her computer as well as her SD card, so she thought that he may have taken the photos either from the SD card or her laptop and then uploaded them onto his own personal computer. Because once again, as I stated earlier, she moved out of the house when she was around 23. So she lived with him from the age of 18 till around 23. So during that time, he would have had access to her computer and possibly that SD card and the camera. At the time of finding these photos, Jay just described feeling so, so violated, disgusted. This was a man who called her his daughter, a man who she saw as a father. And now she finds all of these very personal photos of herself on his computer and as his screensaver. She didn't know what to do. She said that if she deleted them, she didn't know what Tom would say. She was worried that if she had said anything or if she deleted the photos and he noticed, that he would become violent or aggressive with her. Jade said that after finding these photos, she felt so disgusted that she didn't even want to touch her own skin or even wash herself in the shower. And she threw up several times immediately and in the days after finding these photos. She was scared to even be naked at all because she felt so vulnerable. She said that after this, she couldn't even sleep in her bed. Instead, she slept on a tarp that would make noise if anybody stepped on it, and she slept with a knife next to her. After that, Jade had remembered about her friend Sam, who had told her about another man who he had gone to high school with, a guy named Alan Roach, who did private security. The same day that she found these photos, she got Sam to connect the two of them, and then she texted Alan. She explained to Alan that Sam told her that if she ever needed help, that she could reach out to Alan. So the two of them met up and I imagine she told him all about the entire situation. By December 24th, she had Alan stand outside of the bathroom while she showered so that she could feel safe. He also told her to get security cameras for the house. Now, she initially asked Alan if he would work with her to come up with a plan for how to go about all of this. She asked him if after she picked up Tom from the hospital, if he would meet up with her at Tom's house and be there when she confronted Tom about the photos and he agreed to do so. Tom had been discharged from the hospital by 11.19 a.m. on December 31st. When he was released, he was given several different medications, including Zolpidem, better known as Ambien, also Oxycodone and Trazodone. So Jade went and picked up Tom from the hospital and drove him home. But on the way home, she stopped at the local BevMo and purchased a large bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey, a mini bottle of Kettle One vodka, a bottle of Irish whiskey, and a bunch of chocolates. Then she went to a Dixie line where she purchased terry cloth towels, zip ties, two types of gloves, and spray paint. She was done at this store by 12.27 p.m. Then she drove the two of them to his home. However, the day after, by January 1st of 2021, the San Diego County Sheriff's Department received a call to go do a welfare check at the home of Tom Merriman. So, a detective arrived at the house at around 4.40 p.m. on that day. He initially searched around the area and knocked on the door, 
but Tom was not answering. So four more detectives were sent to check out the situation, but still Tom was nowhere to be found. So they were able to quickly get a search warrant for Tom's house as well as Jade's house since Jade was nowhere to be found and she was known to have been the person to pick up Tom from the hospital, so obviously the last person that was with him. This warrant was quickly approved by 12.30 a.m. now on January 2nd. Immediately, police officers began searching inside of the house, waiting until daylight to search the outside areas. But then, by 7 a.m. on January 2nd, police looked outside and around the driveway, and that is when they found Tom's body, laying on the ground on the driveway. He had been basically buried underneath blankets, boxes, and trash. It was clear to the officers that Tom was deceased at this point and that he had been on that driveway underneath the trash the entire time. Very quickly after, by 7.15 a.m., Jade was spotted driving her car and she was pulled over and arrested on suspicion of murder. Initially, Jade told the police that after picking up Tom from the hospital, he was immediately agitated. He called the hospital a shithole and said that he hadn't slept the entire time that he was there. She also mentioned that she had a pill container in her center council, which had gabapentin. So she said that while she had been inside of the CVS and the BevMo that day, Tom took her gabapentin in addition to all of the medication that he had already been prescribed. She said that she was expecting to meet up with a friend at Tom's house so that this person could help bring Tom inside, but the friend didn't show. So when they got there, she tried getting Tom out of the car by herself, but he was so groggy and so out of it that he wasn't helping at all, so he ended up falling two times, leaving him with a scrape on his head and the back of his hand. After that, she said that she knew she really needed help, so she ended up getting a different friend and that friend's boyfriend to come over and help. When they got there, she said that they folded down the back seats of her forerunner and that the two friends helped Tom get back into the back of the car. The seats were folded down so that Tom could lay down more comfortable with some pillows and blankets in the back of the car. She said that after this, after he was back in the car, she took him back to the hospital and tried getting him readmitted since clearly he wasn't ready to go home. But she said because of COVID, he wasn't allowed to come back in, so she said that they denied him. So she went home with him, still in the car, and left Tom in the car overnight on New Year's Eve. She said that doing this wasn't super uncommon as Tom would often get drunk. She would pick him up from wherever he was and he would usually sleep it off in the car overnight. She said usually what would happen was that he would fall asleep in the car and then he would wake up only a few hours later and then walk back into the house to sleep for the rest of the night. She said that there was no way that she was going to be able to pick him up and bring him inside in the condition that he was that night. So, she said that she had no choice but to leave him there. She said that after going into Tom's place for the night, she made the decision just to destroy the computer that had all the nude photos of her on it. She said that she poured whiskey all over his computer and took out what she thought looked like a hard drive. By the next morning on January 1st, she went out to her car and discovered that Tom was still in the car, but he was not moving. She said that she opened the door, saw him lying there, and then she touched his leg, but his leg was cold. She said that after finding him, she actually knew pretty much right away that he was dead, but this just caused her to spin into a panic. She said that she then drove back to the hospital to pick up a wheelchair. Then she went back home and tried putting his body into a wheelchair so that she could get him inside of the house, but his body just fell onto the ground on the driveway once again. She said that at this point, she just could not move him because it was just too much for her, so she just left him there. She said that she decided to pull a blanket over him and then cover his body with boxes and trash so that their neighbors would not see him. She said she didn't call 911 right away because she didn't want to get blamed. 
she knew she had just destroyed his computer and she knew that she was the last one who saw him since she picked him up from the hospital. She said that she didn't want to be blamed for his death. However, there were a lot of things about this story and about the whole situation that just did not sit right with investigators and they thought that it was possible that she actually killed her stepfather. So, on that same day, that is when they arrested Jade. One of the first things that investigators did was they looked through the cellular data on Jade's cell phone, which showed multiple text messages between her and Alan Roach, as well as with others. In these conversations, what they found was pretty suspicious. So, going back to the day of December 30th, 2020, on this day at 12.40 p.m., she sent a text message to a friend named Mike. She wrote, quote, I still struggle with moral issues, yet I will never not be looking over my shoulder, so I made the call. Of course, he asked her what she meant by that, and in response, she said, it means everything that you think it means. By that evening, Jade was texting back and forth with Alan Roach, and I will read the messages as follows. Jade at 5.27 p.m. said, my mind is spinning. Then at 6.46 p.m., she said, I've got a plan. At 6.46 p.m., Alan Roach responded, I need to have a clear mind now that the time is near. At 7.08 p.m., Alan texted again saying, there's no room for error, but I think he meant to put error. By 7.13 p.m., Jade responded, I've given this some thought. I have an easy solution. The next day on December 31st, that morning as when we know, Tom had been discharged from the hospital with Jade picking him up at around 11.30 a.m., at the same time, Jade had texted Alan saying, I just dosed the hell out of him. Stopping for whiskey, then stopping at Dixie Line to stall. Let me know. After that is when she stopped at the stores that we discussed earlier, where she got various types of alcohols, those cloths, those zip ties, gloves, and spray paint. By that point though, Alan had not responded to her last text message. So, at 12.39 p.m., Jay texted Alan saying, I can't carry him either back to my car or to his house. I'm not strong enough. Can you come, like, right away? But he didn't respond to this either. So, she ended up texting an ex-boyfriend of hers, a man named Adam Sipiak. He was someone she dated in the past, and actually the two had just gone on that Mexico trip together, but they weren't actually like together. It was more of a platonic friend type of thing. She wrote at 12.44 p.m. to Adam, 911, call me. But he was getting a tattoo at the time, so he wasn't able to come help. He told her to call another friend named Chucky. She called the friend, but he also wasn't able to come and help her. By 12.52 p.m., Jay texted her friend named Sarah Jacobs. She wrote, he is alive. Please don't ask me any questions. Just help me get him into the house. And again, as we discussed earlier, her and her boyfriend, Justin, came over to the house where they found that Tom had fallen out of the car and they helped her lift him back to get into the car. At 12.57 p.m., Jay texted Alan again saying, I had to call someone to help me carry him inside. I wish you were closer. Once Tom was back in the car, Jade told Sarah and Justin that she was going to drive him back to the hospital and they watched as she drove away with him in the car. By 2.38 p.m., Jade texted Alan once again saying, he's waking up, I really didn't want to be the one to do this. By 2.39 p.m., Alan finally responded offering to send over his partner. By 2.44 p.m., Jade responded that she did not want to involve a lot of people, to which Alan did not respond. So, she texted again at 2.48 p.m. and said, I am super uncomfortable having another person involved. Then, she texted him again at 2.49 p.m. saying, it's pretty much done. I don't need to talk to anyone. At 2.51 p.m., Jay texted Alan again saying, how soon will you get here? It's going to be weekend at Bernie's. At 2.57 p.m., Alan texted that he would send over his partner saying, just throw him a bill and I will give him a bill. 
going on to say, I still have the money you gave me earlier, but I won't be seeing him. At 2.59 p.m., Jade texted, he is waking up. I am not sure how much longer I can control my temper. Then again, at 3.14 p.m., Jade texted, I asked you for help. I tried to do it on my own. I need your help and I'm waiting on a stranger. By 3.17 p.m., a man named Brian Salomon, who is known to be Alan's partner, is seen entering a CVS where he bought a pair of gloves. Then at around 3.30 p.m., Brian arrived at Jade's home. He asked, what do you want me to do? And according to Brian, Jade told him, I want you to strangle him and I'll take care of the rest. Brian Salomon responded that he had to make a call, but instead, after the call, he left and ran down the driveway, refusing to help with that request. This was a statement that Brian made about 18 months after this all happened, after being questioned, and after police found the cell phone information, but I didn't want to confuse you by bringing it up later, so that is why I included it right now. By 3.41 p.m., Alan texted Jade, I ordered him to leave. I didn't want him involved like that. Then at 4.06 p.m., Jade texted Adam again saying, are you done? To which he responded, no, he was still getting his tattoo. Then by 4.08 p.m., Jade started texting Alan again repeatedly. She wrote, F, he is up. I guess I am on my own. At 4.12 p.m., she said, by the way, he is waking up and getting way more aggressive. By 4.28 p.m., she said, he is super medicated. I can't keep a kicking body in my truck. I'm about ready to club him. By 4.30 p.m., she said, he's waking up. I'm about ready to club him. 4.32 p.m., she said, I asked you for your help. I can't do it alone. By 4.35 p.m., she said, he is very aware and I am on my own. At 5.01 p.m., she said, why are you not responding? This entire time, again, Alan was not responding. So, Jade's phone showed that she actually went on the website for the local police and searched if Alan had been in jail. But by 6.05 p.m., Alan finally responded. He wrote, so sorry, I got family shit that I'm dealing with. Then, Jade responded asking if he can come over. At 6.16 p.m., Alan texted, I have a better idea, but it can't be taken care of tonight. Can't afford a messy job site. By 7.30 p.m., Adam, Jade's ex, finally arrived to the house. According to what Adam would later testify, when he got there, Jade told him about the photos that she found on Tom's computer. She allegedly admitted to him that she killed Tom by first drugging him, then suffocating him with a bag, and then she apparently strangled him. He said that Jade then asked Adam to put Tom on his bed, but Adam said no, and he left. He said that he wanted nothing to do with this. By 8.12 p.m., Jade texted Alan again, saying, can you let me know if I'm alone? Then she texted, now I have hours until bruising shows. Need to get inside. This does not end well for me. By 9.24 p.m., Jay texted Alan again saying that she was going to bed but still needed to, quote, figure out my issue. By January 1st at 9.30 a.m., Adam had actually called 911 to report what he had just apparently learned but obviously, Jade did not know about that. By 9.59 a.m., Jade continues texting people. She texted her friend Sarah once again, saying that she needed a favor. She texted two more times after that, but Sarah said this time her and Justin just could not help. By 3.49 p.m., Jade texted Alan, I just need to get him inside. Plan B does not end well for me. By 4.41 p.m., Tom's brother Terrence sent a text to Tom's cell phone, which Jade allegedly had at that time. By 4.50 p.m., Jade called Terrence, who told her that a detective called him looking for Tom. Jade told Terrence that Tom was not available, saying that he was sleeping and recovering from alcohol and Xanax rehab. At 4.52 p.m., Jade texted Alan once again, saying that she received a weird call, that Tom's brother said a guy claiming to be a detective had called him. After that, Jade continued texting Alan multiple times. At 5.07 p.m., she wrote, I really need to clear the trash in the driveway. At 5.12 p.m., she said, if anyone knows, the place would be swarming. 
Then she said again, I have a pile of trash that I need to get rid of. Can you send someone? At 5.20 p.m., she said, I really, really need to clear the trash in the driveway. By 5.33 p.m., Jade sent her last text message to Alan saying, lose my number, I am getting pulled over. At 9.01 p.m. on the same day, Jade was interviewed at the police station. She was asked, do you know where Tom is? To which she responded, no. And then she said, I think I need to speak with an attorney. At 4.30 a.m., Jade was released because Tom's body had not been found by that point. But by 7 a.m., as we know, his body was found and she was arrested once again. Of course, after Tom's body was found, he was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. On the toxicology report, they found that he had all of the prescription drugs that he was given in his system as well as the gabapentin, which he was not prescribed, but Jade was. By the way, gabapentin is just another pain-relieving medication. The medical examiner also found that he had cardiomegaly, which is enlargement of the heart, as well as hepatomegaly, which is enlargement of the liver. But the medical examiner said that he found absolutely no sign of strangulation, asphyxia, or suffocation on Tom's body. But what he did find was that there was a toxic amount of Ambien in his system. So, he ruled that Tom's cause of death was zolpidem intoxication with cardiomegaly and hepatomegaly being contributing factors. He said that he found from 5 to 20 times the normal amount of Ambien in his system. He said that Tom's liver dysfunction would have affected the way the drug was metabolized, so that is why he isn't exactly sure the exact amount. He said that Tom's liver dysfunction would have affected how the drug was metabolized, so that is why he's not sure the exact amount that was found in his system. For those of you who don't know, the liver is the organ responsible for filtering out a lot of the toxins in your body as well as your kidneys. So when people are drinking and they say like, I'm killing my liver, it's because the liver is the main organ responsible for filtering out all of the alcohol. So hepatomegaly and liver dysfunction is very common in people who have issues with drug use and especially alcohol abuse. Either way, the medical examiner concluded that his cause of death would have been around 12 to 18 hours before his body was found. Then, as I mentioned throughout the portion of the video where we discussed the text messages, both Adam, her ex-boyfriend, and Brian, Alan's partner, told the police that Jade admitted to each of them that she had killed Tom. So, because of all of that, Jade was charged with the first-degree murder of Tom Merriman. As she awaited her trial, her bail was set to a million dollars, but she did post her bail and she was allowed to go home given that she wear a GPS ankle monitor. The trial for murder started in November of 2022 and Jade pled not guilty for charges of murder. The prosecution argued that after finding the photos of herself on Tom's computer, she reached out to Alan for help on figuring out exactly what to do and initially, she thought of just confronting Tom on the photos with Alan present. But as the day for his discharge kept coming closer and closer, Jade instead decided that she was going to murder Tom. They argued that she drugged him, then strangled him to death. In doing so, she asked multiple friends for help in killing him and then getting rid of the body. They say that his autopsy, as well as the text messages and witness testimony, will all show that she is guilty. Of course, the defense argued that she did not kill Tom. They said that he died as a result of his own medication causing toxicity and overdose because of the years of drug abuse and his very poor health. They stated that the text messages were very poorly worded and that they don't look good, but it doesn't show that she is a murderer. It shows that she was panicked and that she didn't know what to do after her stepdad overdosed on his own medication. They said that the autopsy will actually show that there were no signs of strangulation. In the trial, the medical examiner, Dr. Greg Pizarro, who did the original autopsy, as well as the chief medical examiner of San Diego, Dr. Steve Chapman, who signed off on the autopsy, both testified. 
Both reported that there was absolutely no sign of asphyxiation, suffocation, or strangulation on Tom's body. There was bruises, but that was most likely from lividity from pooling of the blood due to the way that his body was positioned. There were no bruises, no broken hyoid bone, or any other damaged thyroid cartilage below the skin on the neck, and there are no abrasions to show pressure in the area there was absolutely nothing. However, these professionals conceded that you technically can suffocate someone without leaving a sign on their body. So, if you're under the influence with your respiratory system already depressed, then a pillowcase or a plastic bag placed over the head will space out the force, leaving no marks. Then, if they're already under the influence, then this will accelerate death, and because, again, they're under the influence, they may show no signs of fighting back or resisting being suffocated. However, the defense brought forward their own witness, Dr. Charles O'Connell, who is an ER doctor and a medical toxicologist. He said that after reviewing Tom's medical record, Tom had a lot of issues. He had problems with alcohol and Xanax. He also had hepatitis, hepatic or liver dysfunction, a pacemaker, an enlarged heart, congestive heart failure, swollen and congested lungs, emphysema from prolonged smoking, 30 to 40 percent blockage of his arteries, and broken ribs from his most recent fall. Tom spent nine days in the hospital, and in addition to broken ribs, he was treated for alcohol and Xanax withdrawals. With his liver problems again, it would have taken a lot longer for doses of Ambien to leave his system. The doctor said that with how many problems Tom had, he never would have even prescribed him Ambien. He said that usually Ambien takes 11 to 16 hours to be cleared from the body normally, but in someone with liver dysfunction, it can stack. So he said that because Tom was given 10 milligrams of Ambien for four days in a row before his death, it is possible that it could have reached the amounts that were found in Tom's system when his autopsy was completed. Then we know at the trial that both Adam, her ex-boyfriend, as well as Brian both testified about how Jade had allegedly confessed to them that she killed Tom. So, let's start with Brian, Alan Roach's partner. They talked about how he waited 18 months to report that she confessed to murdering her stepdad. The defense brought forward how Brian also had a criminal history of his own. He had two instances of domestic violence where in May, he pushed his ex-girlfriend out of a moving vehicle. Then in June, he threatened to kill her if she called the police on him. The defense brought up how he waited until he had these two pending cases that he was willing to talk and say what he knew about Jade. They also brought up how Jade had never even met Brian before and she barely knew Alan either. So, how believable is it that she would ask someone she met 60 seconds ago if he would commit murder for her? But, of course, Brian denied all of these accusations and said that he was not lying. Honestly, I'm not exactly sure what he said for why he waited so long to tell the police about what he knew, but... That is what he said at trial. Then let's talk about Adam. It was said that Adam and Jade had actually dated 10 years prior to this and that, you know, there weren't any feelings left between the two of them. They did say again that they went on this trip together, but they did not engage in any physical or sexual relationships during that time. Adam testified that after he went to Jade's house and she asked him to move Tom's body, he was really freaked out that he was now involved in a murder scene. So he wiped away any evidence of his and he left. That night, he went to a New Year's Eve party, but the entire night, he said he was still freaking out. He said that he did not sleep at all that night, so that next morning, that is why he called the police. He said that he was worried initially that the police would think he was involved, so that is why he didn't initially want to call the police right when this entire thing happened. Then the defense brought up how Adam 
also had this past history of violent behavior. He had a case where he had been stalking an ex-girlfriend named Christy. He allegedly texted her that she deserved to die and allegedly told her that he was going to slit her then-boyfriend's throat. She had gotten a restraining order against him, so he allegedly told Christy that he was going to staple the restraining order to her boyfriend's forehead. Then, Adam admitted that when Jade reached back out to him and the two reconnected, he did hope that the two of them would have a sexual relationship again. But she rejected him. So, when she reached out to him on December 31st, he went over there thinking that he would get lucky. But when he went there, again, we know that Jade allegedly told Adam that she had just strangled Tom and that is when he decided to leave. Then, of course, the prosecution read through all of the text messages between her and all the people that she had been contacting that day, as well as all of the different surveillance videos that caught her, as well as Brian, buying various things after picking up Tom. Then, Jade took the stand to testify on her own behalf. Of course, she described the moment that she found the pictures. She actually sobbed on the stand about how badly this entire thing affected her, how scared she was, how disgusted she felt, and how violated she felt. When I went to clean um, in his office area, I was kind of wiping things down and um, I bumped the mouse on his desktop computer and it, it shook the screen awake and I looked and there's a picture of female breasts on the screen and I look and um, I have a beauty mark kind of on my chest and I look and I'm like, those, those are my breasts, so... It was the most violating, just awful, gut-wrenching feeling ever I felt. I felt sick. I, I felt... I couldn't, I couldn't, like, I couldn't even touch my own skin. Um, I don't even know if there's words. I mean, not even in a movie have I seen something so just sick. As we heard earlier, she said that Tom was very agitated, angry, and in a very bad mood when she picked him up from the hospital. She said that she stopped at the CVS to get more prescriptions for him, but there weren't any new ones for him other than the ones that he already had. She said that after picking him up, she was still waiting to hear back from Alan about helping her stepdad get into the house, so she admitted that she did go to the BevMo and Dixie line to stall for a bit longer. She said that she bought the terry towels, a rope, and spray paint for an outdoor project that she had been working on, then she said that the zip ties were purchased to secure the tarp. Then when talking about the text messages that she sent between Alan and other friends, she said that she was just in a panic and a fear for what was to come. She said that when she couldn't get a hold of Alan, she was really worried. Then she described the whole situation that we already discussed, where she called and texted different friends, he fell out of the car, she got friends to come over and help him get back in, then she tried taking him back to the hospital but couldn't, then got him home and he fell out of the car again. Then, as we know, she couldn't get him up from the driveway, so she covered his body so that the neighbors wouldn't see him laying there. Then she said that she left the house on that morning on January 2nd so that she could get into contact with a criminal defense attorney, tell them about the body, and get someone who would be on her side before she went to the police with this information. She said that she knew how bad this entire thing looked, that she picked him up, she destroyed his computer, did all that, and now he was dead on his driveway. So, she wanted to know exactly what to do and what her rights were before she told the police. And again, she did say that she was planning on calling the police as soon as she sorted this aspect out. She said that she was on her way to the attorney's office when she was pulled over and taken in for questioning. Then it came out in trial that Jade's DNA was found on Tom's prescriptions, so on the actual medications. But she explained that when she picked him up, she looked inside each bottle to see what he had been prescribed. 
that's actually not that bad of an explanation. It's totally understandable. If I picked someone up, I'd probably look inside to see what they were prescribed as well. So, I don't really think the whole DNA thing was something that was that big of a deal for them to bring up. Then, when talking about the text message that she sent to Alan, where she said that she dosed the hell out of him, she said that she was just referring to how the hospital gave him so many medications that she was supposed to give him, so she was surprised at how many medications he was supposed to be taken. Then she said that she texted Alan to delete her number because she didn't want him involved in all of this because, again, she said that she knew it all looked really bad, but despite how bad it looked, she denied that she killed Tom. So, that's pretty much what we know from both sides of the trial. After hearing closing arguments from both sides on December 20th, 2022, the jury left for their deliberations. By 9.30 a.m. the following day, it was announced that the jury had reached their verdict. The jury found Jade guilty of the first-degree murder of Tom Merriman, and for that, she was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. And in response, Jade just looked so stunned. I really don't think she thought she would be convicted of this. So she and many of Jade's supporters just started crying. At that point, she was taken back to jail and ultimately sent to prison. Superior Kate, Court of the State of California for the County of San Diego, the people of the state of California plaintiff versus Jade Sasha Jenks, defendant. Case number SCN 420-772. Verdict, count one, first degree murder. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Jade Sasha Jenks, guilty of the crime of murder in violation of penal code section 187, subsection A, a felony, as charged in count one of the amended information and fix the degree thereof as murder in the first degree. Dated today's date, sign the four person. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, was this and is this, your verdict is read? Yes, yes, yes. yes. After the verdict and final thoughts from the prosecution, it was said that the text messages are really what made the jury decide that she did kill Tom and that there was premeditation to it, so that is how they decided on first degree murder. So, that is all we know about this case and let me tell you, I am so, so, so very conflicted. I cannot say too much about Tom because he isn't alive to defend himself, but what I can say is that I do believe he is a perverted man who downloaded those photos. It's one thing if they were found on a random file on his computer, which obviously would be bad, but you could at least make the argument that they accidentally ended up there, like if they were in your downloads folder or if they were in like a random like recovery folder or something like that that didn't have like an actual title. But it was obvious that he had them in folders that he named. To put your stepdaughter's breasts as your screensaver then, not even just having them in like these folders and having hundreds of them, but having that as your screensaver. Who the hell does that? You're literally asking to be caught at that point. The whole thing is just disgusting. I do feel for Jade in that moment when she found the photos. I believe her when she said that she felt so disgusting and violated and scared in that moment. I would have felt the same way if I were in her shoes. Clearly, Tom was a man with a lot of issues. He had a lot of drugs and alcohol use issues. Clearly, the relationship that he had with his wife didn't seem all that great either but that isn't an excuse. That is not an excuse for this perversion. But if I'm being fair and unbiased here, it also isn't a reason to kill someone, or at least it doesn't give you a pass to kill someone. I think this obviously could have been handled differently. I don't exactly know how, but I think for her sake, she didn't have to murder him. She had a lot going for herself, and while I do understand how she must have felt, it is not an excuse and you don't just get to get away with murder because of something like this. Not to say I 100% believe that she purposely killed him because honestly, if I were on that jury, I don't know if I would have been able to convict her based on the evidence that we know. 
yes, those messages are really bad, but at the same time, she never flat out says what she did over any of those text messages. There was no evidence of strangulation on his body, though that was explained, but at the same time, you don't exactly know which side to take. But other than that, and witnesses who aren't really all that reliable, there really isn't a lot that convicted her of first-degree murder here. I think the fact that Adam did call 911 just the morning after, I do think that shows a little bit more reliability in terms of him not just, like, making something up. He called as soon as he could. I mean, obviously, when something like that happens, you do need a little bit of time to process, so I can definitely see how he called the very next day instead of, like, right away. But Brian's testimony, I don't necessarily believe it. I personally think the way this went down was that she did give him too many of his drugs. I do personally think that she gave him too much Ambien. And then I think she was planning on having Alan help her or someone help her get him into the house and on his bed so that he could die on his bed and make it look like an accident. That's what I personally think happened. And then once she couldn't get him out of the car when she couldn't get him into the home. He was lying on the driveway and then this whole mess happened and obviously things did not go as planned and I think that this whole thing just went down. It was a disaster for her. Everything that could have possibly gone wrong went wrong, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what side you're on. So, that is how I think this entire thing went down but if I'm being honest, I just don't know if I was on a jury if I think there's enough information here and enough evidence to show that beyond a reasonable doubt that she murdered her stepfather. So this is a case that just does not have a good ending no matter how you look at it. Either a young woman with a whole lot going for her found these photos, felt violated, and felt like she had to kill the man responsible for what he did. Or she found these photos and was trying to find a way to deal with it she acted out and destroyed his computer and then found herself in literally the world's unluckiest position where he died from his medications and then just did not handle it well at all and now she's sitting in prison. Obviously, I do think it's far too big of a coincidence to say that she just found these photos and then he ends up dying, so I'm not saying that I don't think that she did it per se, but I do lean more towards her being responsible, but I do really want to know what your guys' thoughts are on all of this. Going back to what I said about what happened, I think that after she gave him this medication, as we know from the text messages, he clearly was like starting to come to and maybe she confronted him, maybe not, but maybe she had him in his car and he was like, get me out of this car and she said no and that's when she either put a bag or a blanket or a pillow over his head to strangle him and that is what happened and then again, she tried getting him inside, putting him on the bed, all that to get him to look like an accident, to make it look like an accident I do believe Adam's part where she told him what happened and she was trying to get him to help her and he wouldn't help her, but I don't necessarily know if I believe Brian's statement that he was asked to strangle him for her. I don't know if I believe that. I think it probably was more so that she was asking him to help her move his body. That's what I think about that, but either way, I just leave this case with the absolute worst gut feeling. I hate this case. I hate how it all went down and no matter what happened, and I might get a lot of flack for saying this, but even if she did kill him, I do feel for her. I feel so horrible for what she had to go through. Again, I'm not saying that he deserved to die, but I can't say that I blame Jade for her reaction if she did end up killing him. That's all I have to say about that. Again, this is just an unfortunate case doesn't have a happy ending no matter how you look at it. Either someone who's not guilty went to prison after finding horrific things of her on her computer or she found these horrific things of herself on his computer, felt horrible, felt violated, and took it out on him, and now she's in jail. Either way, I don't think this is a good situation in general. But that is where I will leave today's video and now I want to know what you all think. Do you think that Jade killed her stepdad after finding these photos or do you think the situation is as she described? 
let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out my Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!